All right, let's start. Um, yeah, as you probably already read, the title of this talk is going to be Privileges, Technical Debt. And I usually try to start with a story that I think I've always been fascinated with this fact of public speaking in general. It's kind of a passion for me. I, I usually like to speak, and usually I speak about topics that range from really advanced technical stuff to topics that are super social, like today, today's talk. And I remember this starting, I think, when I was in high school, I took this course, which was about presentation skills and public speaking skills and stuff like that. And this course basically goes through several phases of every presentation, right? Every presentation has this attention grabber, then introduction, then body, then conclusion. Um, does everyone here know, or does anyone here know what is an attention grabber in a public speech kind of sense? Okay, usually when they speak about this in the olden days specifically, they say that the speaker needs to do something to grab the attention of everyone that just came back into the room from, uh, from a sort of a break or, or lunch or whatsoever. And throughout my whole life at the beginning, I always had this fascination of making fancy attention grabbers, right? Like I would build a fancy prop and just enter the room with it and people would be like, oh, what is this guy going to speak about and then never use it. Um, but then I moved to Europe, I think six years ago, and something quite interesting happened because what I started to notice is that people give a bit more attention to, to me and because of the fact of me being a person of color in some situation, bigger in size, having curly hair. Yeah, so, and that's just not really on stage, actually, in the streets. Also, people give a lot of attention for that. <laughs> a bit about myself. So, this is my name, Amr Abdulhab. Actually, this is the simplified name because my full name is Amr Muhammad Abdulhab Mahmoud Goda Hassan. <laughs> you don't need to learn that. <laughs> um, yeah, I am a senior software engineer, mostly doing Ruby slash Elixir. Like this is the author of Ruby in front of me there. <laughs> I think if there is something I would like you to come out from this talk is that in the 12 years that I spent in this industry, I think that communities matter the most, right? As much as technology and everything we build is important, but communities around it is what matters the most. I was born and raised in Cairo in Northern Africa. And in 2013, I moved to Budapest. Uh, you know, like Hungarians and Polish are brothers and they dance together and this <laughs> this thing and then i moved to berlin in 2017 so i'm currently resident in berlin in germany and before i start this talk I, I i was actually thinking to myself like do i really need to give this talk am i the person to give this talk to people why and why me so a very important thing i'm not an expert on the method that i'm going to speak about right this is more of a talk that comes from the heart um, of a fellow developer like yourself. The other aspect, of course, I think many people, especially outside this room, would think, ah, oh, this talk is very irrelevant to, 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 a technical to, to a technical conference. Even myself, honestly, when I was thinking at the beginning, I was thinking like, is it really relevant to speak about it to technical people? But the fact is, it is really relevant, right? It impacts the daily life of myself and probably thousands, if not even hundreds of thousands of your, of your fellow developers. The second thing that makes me, I think, eligible to, to speak about this is that I have this privileged background in myself. Um, I come from a middle to high class family in, back in Egypt and I belong to the like the Muslim majority of Egypt, right? Which is not here a majority, but there it is. Surprisingly, I belong to what we call in Egypt the lighter shade of black. So the darker you are, the less privileged you are. So I always was treated as white enough in Egypt. Uh, I am cisgender, straight male. And in the past, when I lived in Egypt before 2013, many times a friend of mine who is a woman or an LGBT friend or, or I don't know, a darker friend would come and confront me and say like, or a Christian friend in Egypt, for example, would come and say like, okay, this is so bad. The situation is horrible. We need to address these things. And honestly, I felt sympathy. I mean, I felt sad. I wasn't like uh, this guy. I was never this kind of person that would say like, oh, I dismiss all this stuff. But deep inside, I always had this question. Why are those people so sensitive? Right? Deep inside, I had this feeling like, aren't they making a big fuss out of this situation? Maybe it's not as big as they all are assuming. Right? 
And I would say that I fell for this common, what I now see as like fallacies, right? Like there are a lot of fallacious arguments around these topics that are not real. And I was myself one of the people repeating these arguments in the past. But then I moved to Europe. And a lot of these privileges I m mentioned before already starts to collapse, right? And I started to face these daily actions of people looking down to you just because of things you didn't do, right? Like people on a daily basis treat you like this. Actually, I realized that I need to always do 10 times more effort to achieve the same result as a fellow white European male um, developer. In fact, because of this statement, it seems like an opinion. This statement uh, comes from a one-on-one -on -one meeting with my German manager in the past. So he said, ah, oh, yeah, you're black. You need to do 10 times more effort for people to accept what you do. So it's not my statement. I started to face what I today call racist behaviors all the time everywhere. Back in the time when I first moved, I didn't call it racist, right? I actually started to question myself. Is it me who is becoming oversensitive to these things or what's happening? Maybe I am doing something wrong. Maybe I am, I don't know, not fitting into this group well. Maybe I'm not thinking well. And I started to always live into this blame factor of like blaming myself that maybe I'm doing something wrong and I cannot integrate with these people properly. And then that was the moment where I started to say, okay, this is not a new thing, right? This, there is literature that goes hundreds of years speaking about this specific topics. So there is enough stuff and enough readings and research done on this topic. So try to read, try to check what people think about that. And this was the moment that I realized that my whole life I was missing context. My whole life I didn't understand what's happening around these things. So I decided to take it further and try to speak to people who I believe unintentionally and I insist on this unintentionally damage their peers, because if you intentionally damage someone, you're not welcomed in this room, so please leave. Um, <laughs> I think I will try, or I am trying in my life now to add as much context to this topic, to speak around this topic as much as I can to people. <coughs> Sorry. This, this section of the presentation tries to actually elaborate a bit more on what does it mean privilege, right? Because I mentioned these things, but I will try to elaborate more. And maybe what people usually do in boring presentations is that they start with having a Wikipedia presentation there and then they would be like super slowly and super loudly reading this definition and no one really cares. But what I want to mention is that specifically in social topics, Wikipedia definitions does not apply. In fact, any dictionary definition or translation does not apply. You should never ever go read about racism from uh, Thesaurus. Like, it just doesn't work, right? You need to understand the context behind it. Okay, something weird is happening. So I came up with this game, which I call it the Calculate Your Privilege Score. Like, let's just do this game that you need to add some one to your, like one to your privilege score if you can do this. So if you can go on social media, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, and post any post you think of without ending up in jail, murdered or exile, add one to your score. Um, I can give you a, actually a very recent event. In the last six days, there were 1,400 Egyptian people arrested by being stopped in the streets, asked to check their phone and if they find any opposition posts on their Facebook, they arrest them. True story, you can Google it. Plus one for yourself, if you can just go to any person you feel you love and just say, I love you. I add one for myself, right? I have being a straight male, that, that's easy, that's fine. I can just go to anyone and to any woman I like and I say, ah, I love you and nothing will happen. But in my country or in Russia or in many other countries, if you are a gay person and you just go to the person you love and say, I love you, you can end up in jail or murdered or <laughs> whatsoever. Um, this is, I find this topic very relevant to technical conferences. Oftentimes people would go uh, in technical conferences and do uh, talks about remote work or digital nomading or whatsoever. And no one ever tries to talk about how hard is it to get a visa for non-white people, right? No one ever tries to address the issue that I spent the last six years of my life applying on visa stuff and doing visa things. And they say, yeah, why aren't you working remotely? You can make more money and live wherever you want. Well, I can't. If I don't work in an office, I get no visa. Um, yeah, add one to yourself if you are not always selected in the random selection of the airport because yeah, my passport has the name Muhammad as a second name and 
yeah, somehow, somehow I'm always randomly selected. I can really keep going into this list, I think, until tomorrow, but I think you get the concept, right? Like, it's a privilege is something that is something that you can do and other people can't. This is it. In a nutshell, it's also not something set in stone. So when I call you privileged, it's related to your context, right? As I said, I was a member of the Muslim minority, a majority in Egypt, I'm now a member of the Muslim minority in Europe, and that becomes from a privilege to an underprivilege automatically. Uh, so as I said, it's really, really coupled to its context. I also apologize for the way I used like this com compare yourself in privilege because I don't believe that privileges are that easily comparable in a one equal one. It's not, it doesn't really equate like this. It was just an oversimplified thing. Privileges are really intersectional, right? So when you speak about a black woman, she has way less privileges than a white woman and then both of them has way less privileges than a white man. Uh, on the other side, you cannot do things like uh, I am trying to diversify my team and have more women, but you are still excluding black people. It doesn't work like this. Everything has to intersect at the core. The most important part of this presentation is when I say you are privileged, I am not saying that you are evil. So privilege does not equal evil. Privilege is more like a debt, right? When you are privileged, you have some extra duties you need to do to kind of equal or balance this privilege thing. And people usually will say things like, okay, I did nothing wrong. I mean, I was born white. Why do I need to do extra efforts more than you? Which is valid, but let me ask you this question. Who here maintains a legacy code base or maintained in the past? Yeah, I, I assume everyone at some point <laughs> did that, right? And when you inherit this project, right, you know for sure that the previous developer have done the best they could do in the current situation they had. In some situations, you need to build some incomplete solutions because the business needs, the business came and said, oh, we need this to be pushed today. I don't care how bad is the quality. This is a massive business idea and we need to do it. Or I don't know, you, did, you never know the future, right? Future changes. So you took some uninformed decision or the team took some uninformed decisions that led to having a massive technical debt today. Or, I mean, you just went to a conference and someone, and you are a team of two people and someone said, ah, microservices are the best, so you split the monolith and <laughs> you split it wrong because you were just following a hype, right? That happens. Many people follow hypes and end up introducing technical debt. That's what we, as I said, that's what, in, what introduces what we all refer to as technical debt. And when you are trying to deal with technical debt, you cannot ignore the past mistakes. You didn't do it, right? In 90% of the cases, it was someone else in the team that did something in the past, but you cannot ignore it. You cannot just live with the happy case and say, ah, oh, no, our code is perfect. I don't care what happened in the past. You also cannot rewrite everything from scratch because you will end up rewriting your application once a week, right? The way you deal with technical debt is you keep shipping, you keep moving forward, but you still are mindful of what happened in the past. You need to always have it in the back of your mind that this happened because of that and we will tackle it throughout our life. Well, we know that we have a 200,000 years old project and billions of developers worked on that project and actually unlike your project, not all of them had the best intentions. I mean, Hitler was working on that for example. Um, yeah, everything in this project is super highly coupled, like it's super complex. Um, and the project is horribly documented because every single person write their own version of documentation. And the project is obviously not secure enough. There are no tests written, so you cannot know if you broke anything. And it's clear this project exists and we call it humanity, right? And we are all maintaining it, so we need to keep moving forward, but we need to keep being aware of what happened in the past. One last thing about this definition thing is that our industry has this tendency to decontextualize things because in our industry, it's fine to ignore the context and just focus on the exact uh, problem we are solving. We want to follow the single responsibility principle all the time, right? We want things that do one thing and one thing only, doesn't really care about what's happening around it. We would like to write things that are isolated, decoupled, does not know anything about what's happening around it. In fact, if I put anything before agnostic and I said like, 
something agnostic services, people cheer, right? Platform agnostic service, technology agnostic service. People want things not to know about the context. But it's important to know that this does not apply on everything. Right? Technology is not applicable. Like this concept from technology cannot be borrowed in everything. Specifically, when it comes to social sciences and politics and these kind of topics, context is necessary to understand anything. You cannot understand something unless you understand what's surrounding it. So, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I was falling for this for these fallacies things, right? And I think these these are still used every day. Every person that tweets anything that relates to diversity or empathy or whatsoever will get one of these uh, fallacies as an answer. In fact, many times they would come from a woman or a black person, and that can be a title or a topic of a talk that we can focus on. Why do people internalize oppression sometimes? But I wanted to address some of them. And let's start with my favorite, the intention versus the impact. So whenever you actually complain about something in general and say, okay, that was not good, people will often reply with the sentence, he did not mean it. And I mean that it's a he because 90% of the case it's a he. So, well, intentions when you are damaging someone is so irrelevant. It doesn't matter actually anymore if you are damaging someone. Why? Imagine this scenario that you are in the park and you are playing frisbee and then you throw the frisbee, it hits someone's face, they fall, they have concussion, and then you tell them, I don't mean it. It doesn't work like that. You hurt that person even if, though you didn't mean it, you need to apologize and you need to take them to the hospital and fix the problem. On the contrary, when someone is trying to do something good, intentions are very important. Oftentimes what I see is that companies do things like diversity uh, quota or whatsoever without even understanding why are they doing these things. So they end up having people much more damaged than not doing anything at all. The second argument is all lives matter. Probably to explain a bit of background for people who don't know what's Black Lives Matter, as a response to police brutality against uh, black people in the US, there was this campaign, Black Lives Matter. And the right-wing activists, like Trump supporters and so on, responded with All Lives Matter campaign, right? That was, everyone was like, oh no, it's not Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter. What this is trying to say is that Black Lives Matter was about suggesting that black people are more important, which is not the case, that, that was not the suggestion, right? It was simply trying to point out the fact that black people's lives are relatively undervalued in the US. It's showing that it's less, not more. In fact, it was trying to say that black people's lives are more likely to be ended by the police. This is a statistical fact. This is not something that has opinions in it. Well, what it, they were trying to say is to push this country to recognize the inequity and perhaps end it, right? Because that's what we all want. Maybe a better way to say it would have been Black Lives Matter too. Um, so yeah, simply all lives matter, but it's only one subset that is currently undervalued. Maybe this will help you understand more the problem with all lives matter. All right. So why am I saying this? I mean, this obviously is a very American thing that doesn't apply to this context at all, but you will be surprised by how many times someone would try to point out any problem in any situation and then you will often have this white person, white male specifically, going and saying, ah, oh, well, we are all uh, suffering from the same problem. No, you are not, right? You cannot expect a Christian person from Krakow in the 1930s going to a Jewish person and saying, we are all under the same oppression. No, you are not. You are simply not. Um, I will leave you now with this video about the concept of microaggressions because I know this is one of the concepts that people are finding really hard to grasp. Still don't think that microaggressions are a problem? Oh, you're so well-spoken. Oh. Just imagine, instead of being a stupid comment, a microaggression is a mosquito bite. Ugh, it's a compliment. <laughs> mosquito bites and their itch are one of nature's most annoying features. 
But if you're only bitten every once in a while... No, where are you really from? Uh, Cleveland? Sure, it's annoying, but it's not that big a deal. The problem is that some people get bitten by mosquitoes a lot more than other people. I mean, a lot more. Whether it's on a date... Oh, your English is so good. Excuse me? Going grocery shopping. You know, everything happens for a reason. I'm just buying apples. Commuting to work. So when are you going to have a baby? Watching TV. We have to keep the Redskins name. It's part of our culture and history. Or just walking down the street with your partner. <gasps> I couldn't even tell you were gay. <sighs> Mosquitoes seem to pop up everywhere. Do you know John? Give me shopping so advice. Oh, I love Cher too. And getting bit by mosquitoes every goddamn day. Can I touch your hair? Multiple times a day. So pretty. Can, can I touch, touch your it? Hair? Please. Oh, please. Oh, please. Oh, please. Oh, please. Can I please? It's oh, fucking oh, annoying. That makes you want to go ballistic on those mosquitoes. <laughs> which seems like a huge overreaction to people who only get bit every once in a while. It's just a mosquito bite. Who cares? Just another angry black one. Of course, beyond just being annoying, some mosquitoes carry truly threatening diseases that can mess up your life for years. Astrophysics? Hmm, maybe you should try this challenging major. Ow, my dreams. And other mosquitoes carry strains that can even kill you. It looked like you was up to trouble, okay? I felt threatened. So next time you think someone's overreacting, just remember, some people experience mosquito bites all the time. You're all so exotic. So just remember that some people experience mosquito bites all the time. It's not the, that specific comment that it triggers that overreaction. The reaction is coming from having it continuously on daily basis all the time. One last thing, I think this is the most common argument that people um, talk about, is the concept of this is reverse sexism, right? When you do diversity quota, you are being sexist against men or being racist against white people and, and so on and so forth. Uh, for example, this tweet here, the guy, the dude says, uh, being a straight heterosexual male on Twitter in 2018 is harder than it was being openly homosexual in the, in the 1960s. This is a great example of removing context, right? Because I have never ever heard in my life about a person being murdered, arrested because of being a straight male. Like, this just never happened. But people are still being killed today. I'm not talking about the past. People are still being killed because of being gay everywhere around the world. Um, for me, when someone says sentences like this, it sounds like a British person coming to me and complaining that life is unfair, that Britain doesn't have an Independence Day. Well, <laughs> that's the reason. So it's important to note that the, the, the dictionary definition of oppression or racism or sexism is usually wrong because it cannot be called something like this unless it has an, an attached historical baggage to it, right? Like there has to be something that happened in the past that kind of made it like this. There has to be also a sort of power imbalance, right? The weaker person is usually under the oppression. If you are strong enough to get over this, that's not oppression anymore, right? So that's just taking back the stuff. To sum it up, we are not really trying to seek equality, but we are trying to seek what we call equity and liberation. For example, in this picture, right? You don't want to give everyone the same box. You want to give people enough options so that they reach kind of the same fair value at the end. And maybe at the end, we want to push completely this wall, right? And become, go away, get away uh, without it. So, the, the, the thing is, I know, yeah, so far I have been talking about politics and ethics and maybe we have different moral compass, right? Not all of us believe in the same kind of ethical values, so maybe we have different uh, ideas, but is it only a question of ethics? Is it only a question of political ethics? It's not actually, like diversity and inclusion are things that are so important for pragmatic reasons as well. Um, I will try in the next period to show you some examples of how the, like how these things can actually like have um, impact on your product. There is this, uh, what I usually refer to as the famous, which is so not famous last name issue. If I ask anyone in the audience now who does web, for example, if you want to build a new database and you want to have a user table there, what will be the fields? 99% of the answers will include the fields first name and last name, right? Um, this is, for example, from the official guide of Rails, and they have it like that. There is an implicit assumption there that every person on this life has a first and the last name. And let's 
that's what I usually refer to as a good example of false consensus effect, right? False, false consensus effect is this thing that we believe that everyone else has the same beliefs, the same thoughts, the same tendencies, the same attributes as we do, which is not, which is not true, right? The first surprise is I don't have a last name. Like, I just simply don't. I have a first name and that's it. I'm not alone in this. There are 100 million Egyptians and I'm sure there are other nations in the world that don't have last names. We just follow a different naming convention that you do. And while this issue might seem very trivial to you, we had like yesterday in the speaker's dinner, we were speaking about like how many things I had to go through because I lived in two different European countries where each one of them picked a different last name for me from my passport. And I ended just having this massive issues opening bank accounts and stuff just because of something as simple as that. You don't really gain anything out of splitting the name field into two. Um, I love this GitHub repo. It's called the Awesome Falsehoods. Um, well, basically it tries to list all these kind of things that we as developers usually try to do, thinking that it's so ubiquitous, like this is how it is, but it's not. And I go usually through this list and I'm amazed because almost every software project have like tons of these. So please check it out. The second thing is between quotes, the racist camera uh, phenomenon. And yeah, the internet is full of these videos showing how cameras usually deal with different races differently. Um, there is this, for example, where uh, Nikon cameras have this AI that tries to say, okay, this is a blinking or not because any Asian person that would appear there would be called a blinking, marked as blinking person. There is this video we can also watch a bit of it. Oh, Desi. This is using the video tracking software. All right. Explain. My coworker Wanda and I are sitting in front of an HP Media Smart computer. Uh, state of the art computer, wouldn't you say? I'd say. We're using the, fa the face tracking software, so it's supposed to follow me as I move. I'm black. <laughs> I think my blackness is interfering with the computer's ability to, to follow me. As you can see, I do this no following not really not really following me I back up I get really really close to try to let the camera recognize me not happening now my white coworker Wanda is about to slide into frame you will immediately see what I'm talking about Wanda if you would please sure now as you can see the camera is panning to show Wanda's face, it's following her around. But as soon as my blackness enters the frame, which I, I will, I will sneak into the frame. I'm sneaking in. I'm sneaking in. I'm in there. That's it. It's and over. there we go. It, it stopped. Are, my hands are here, Wanda. Yeah, um, but I mean, how, right? I mean, it's it's not that people were intentionally building softwares because they are racist assholes and they wanted to make it not work. That's not the case. What happened in the past? is this Shirley cards. Does anyone recognize this photo? This lady here, Shirley, she was the model of Kodak in the 50s. And they used her to uh, do what they call the standard color reference cards for the industry of photography in the 50s. What's very important to note here is that intentionally, it wasn't something that happened by mistake. Like there were meetings in Kodak that said, should we try to have more people of color there? And they said, well, it's not worth it because no black person is, can afford to buy a camera at this stage, right? So to cut down from the film camera industry and from the chemicals, they just ignored completely the, the other races. And while we are, I think, I don't know, uh, 70, 80 years later, we don't even use these films anymore. We have digital cameras. This still has its implications on the modern days, right? So there are so many efforts. I mean, we cannot ignore how many efforts are being done. So there are so many companies trying to put effort into trying to fix this issue, but this issue still persists 80 years later because some person at the beginning said, why, why try to think about inclusion? Another uh, case is what I refer to as the mysterious case of sexist airbags. <laughs> I don't know how many people of you know this story, but when airbags were first released, women and children were statistically less safe with airbags in comparison to men. That's a true story. And yes, it was because of bias again, right? Because 
at the beginning, it was mostly all male engineer teams working on that, right? And the way they would create test dummies is that they will get the average heights and weights of the team and just create test dummies out of it. Uh, is it still working? Yeah. So, as you can see, what happened here in those three use cases is that we created non-functioning products just because of the fact that we didn't have more diverse people to point out problems that we could never think of, or we intentionally even have some things from the past that went wrong. So you need to really think about um, inclusion, inclusion and not just diversity, I'm talking about inclusion in every single step, starting from recruitment to having a diverse team, to the way of designing, you need while designing, you need to think about colorblind people, for example, right? Uh, while development, as I mentioned, think about this first name thing. Think about how do you do payments because it's different how many people and how many users you want to include. When you are testing this test dummy thing, right? You need to think of testing with more. Now, with the realm of data science, there are billions of talks that speaks about how can you be more inclusive. So you need to think about that. At the end, yeah, I've talked a lot about these things, but what should we do now? I think as a company, if someone of you is in a managerial position, start first of all by actually agreeing that there is an issue because there is an issue. This is not something I am claiming or anything. As I said, I'm not an expert, right? I'm a software engineer like you, so hire someone that is an expert in this. And these people actually exist. They offer their services. They can come to your company, educate you. Um, I don't know, have anyone here heard about the term pink washing before? I live in Berlin, in Germany, and oftentimes companies would have like pride flag on their logo and they would like brag all the time about uh, their support of uh, all these kind of things, but deep inside these companies are whole. <laughs> So like, no, uh, stop, stop like just trying to make money out of saying that you support gay people while you are simply not. Just actually do stuff um, that helps people. Try to listen to your underprivileged uh, privileged employees when they complain about things. People are not dumb. I mean, your assumption that you are smarter than people is not correct. When people complain about things, there is something. Um, I would also again mention in, in one of the most successful startups in Germany, uh, when two people went to complain to the manager, he told them, well, I think you are lying because you have a personal issue with that other person that you are accusing of something. True story. <coughs> make sure to guarantee an open and a transparent communication framework for such issues. So make sure to even give some, some way that people can complain without putting themselves out because it's really a hard effort. Well, us as employees, I would like to point out something. Being a software engineer on its own is a privilege. Specifically, it's an accumulative privilege, right? So the more senior you get into our industry, you, you start to realize that, yeah, it's very easy for you to find a job at any place in the world. I think many people in this room recognize this state, right? So acknowledge that this is a privilege and not everyone in the world is like this. Not everyone else can easily find a job anywhere and just move to the country he wants like us. As I said, this market is totally candidate driven. So you need to use this privilege. So as I said, this is a privilege. Make sure to use it. Make sure to listen when people say things are going wrong. And I'm not here just talking about your teammates, but I'm talking about people in the warehouse, for example, of your company, if you're in e-commerce, right? Talk to people in other jobs in your company. And if they complain about something, make sure to speak up about it. Again, I would like to point out, you're not as smart as you think, right? <laughs> so. You are smart, maybe, but not smarter than everyone else in the world. So try to be humble. And when people tell you that there is something, try to listen. Try to do your homework. If you still have doubts about things and you think that people are still overreacting, go and read. There are hundreds of years of researches, of readings, of analysis that can prove that this thing is science. It's not just some pseudoscience or not something that came out in 2019. It's not. Speak up when you see something wrong. As I said, you are privileged enough to find a job. So if your company is, I don't know, selling to the army or to ICE or whatsoever, quit. Tell them I'm not going to work in this company anymore unless you break that contract. This extra bits of money you are making here, I'm going to make you lose it there. 
Finally, as tech community members, I would still tell you, support all diversity-related initiatives, right? When I say, I mean, women who code, uh, Rails girls, Django girls, there are plenty of those and there are plenty of other ones that focuses on other things, not just uh, the gender ones. But at least please make sure to understand why are you supporting these things. You're not supporting these things because you are a nice person. You're supporting these things because this is a debt that you need to pay. You didn't introduce it, but it's a debt you need to pay. Uh, if you have some information, if you did some research, write some blog post about it. Try to, try to talk, try to push this conversation forward and try to go to conferences, meetups. Yeah, try to make a scene, let's say, out of this thing. And finally, if you are a specifically a white male, try to learn further about allyship. What does it mean when you say I am an ally? What does that entail in it? Right? It's not just a, a status that you give to yourself that I support feminism and I support black people. It doesn't work like that. That's also effort that you need to do. And if you decide to take that statue, then you really need to learn way further what can you do to do that. Finally, I would like to address two, ta two sentences. Uh, usually people would say things like, but why don't we all just be nice to each other and move on and the world becomes this pink, nice world? I hope you understand that your ability to say I am sick of politics is a privilege in action. You are sick of politics because your privileges allows you to live this politics free life, right? Uh, you are basically less likely to be a target of bigotry or attacks or deportation and that's why you don't see a need of speaking about political stuff. You are tired of this hustle because your safety is not at stake. The second thing is you thinking that the people like playing the victim cards. Like, yeah, people are just like playing the victim cards to get a, a free conference ticket. Yeah, sure. Uh, I hope you understand that it's really, 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 really hard and exhausting to bring up topics of oppression. As I said, I have been speaking a, lo a lot about technical things and this talk specifically was the hardest talk ever for me to prepare or to think, should I really do it? I know it will trigger a lot of issues. And it, so it's really a hard thing to do. And it's tiring and it's annoying for us more than it is for you. People are f doing this because they are fighting for their life and for their safety. It's not, it's not a joking issue. It's not about the free conference ticket they will get. It's much bigger than this. And if you still don't see that, that simply is because of your privilege. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>